This is the second video for section 1.7 on coloring graphs. In this video, I'll talk about the greedy coloring algorithm. So the general problem that we're trying to solve is to color the regions on a map. And we call this a proper coloring because two states that share a border are given different colors. So if any two regions on our map share a border, we don't want those to be the same color. So we're going to use graphs to model the coloring problem. So every vertex is going to represent a region, or in this case, a state on our map. And then we're going to connect two vertices if those two regions or if those two states share a border. So we end up with a graph that looks something like this. And once we have our model, once we have our graph, like we've done in other similar types of problems, we're going to not think about the original problem and just focus on our graph. So again, our goal is to color in the vertices of this graph so that if any two vertices are connected by an edge, then we give them different colors. And we want to do this using the fewest possible number of colors. We're going to solve this problem by using what we call a greedy algorithm. Greedy algorithms exist for many different kinds of problems. So in general, what a greedy algorithm is, is to put the problem that you're trying to solve in some sort of order. So as we're going to see in a second, we're going to put this problem in alphabetical order, but it really can be any order you want. And then in order, step by step, you make the best choice you can at that time. And you don't think about going back and changing your choices and changing your mind to try to make the solution better. You just say at every step, what's the best choice that I can make right now? And that's the idea of this greediness of just saying like where I'm, where I'm at right now in the problem, what's the best choice? What's the cheapest option I can take? I'm going to take it. And I'm not going to go back and re-examine that. So specifically, the greedy coloring algorithm is to put the vertices in some order. As I said, usually that's going to be an alphabetical order. We're going to choose a list of colors to use, also in some order. And that doesn't really matter. We just have to have a list for the rest of the algorithm to work. And then we're going to go through the list of vertices, coloring each vertex using the first legal color on the list. So what I mean by legal there is that we're going to make sure that no two adjacent vertices, in other words, no two vertices that are connected directly by an edge, that those are never colored the same color. And then we're going to continue in this way until every vertex is colored. So the, again, the idea here is that we're never going to use a new color unless we absolutely have to. OK, so here's our example again with our, our states in the northeast part of the country. And we're going to use this list of colors. So color number one is going to be blue. Color number two is going to be green, red, orange, purple, and so on. If we need a sixth color, I'll invent a sixth color. But let's just start with five and see how that gets us. So our first step is going to be to put these vertices in alphabetical order. And the problem even tells us to use alphabetical order. And that's typically what we're going to do. So we've got 10 states here. So like I said, we're going to take these 10 states, think about our ABCs, and put these in alphabetical order. So here is that alphabetical order. So we start with Connecticut all the way down to Vermont. So walking through the greedy coloring algorithm, our first color is blue. So that means that the first option on our list, the first vertex, Connecticut, is going to be colored in blue. So I'm just going to shade this in blue here. Now, if you don't have colored pens or colored pencils or anything like that, you can just put the number one on the vertex for Connecticut just to indicate color number one. So that's one of the reasons why we use a numbered list here is because not everybody might have those colors uh, available to them. So Connecticut is done. So next up on our list is Delaware. Now, Delaware isn't connected to any other vertex that has a color yet. So we can use blue for Delaware again because we're not breaking the rules for our coloring by coloring Delaware in also in blue. Massachusetts, un unfortunately, is connected directly to Connecticut. So that means that Massachusetts cannot be blue. It has to be a different color from Connecticut. And the second color on our list is green. So Massachusetts, we're going to color in green. So we'd love to use blue again, but we can't because Massachusetts and Connecticut are connected directly by an edge. But Massachusetts is done. Next up on our list is Maine. So ME is Maine. And Maine is not directly connected to any vertex that has a color, which means we can go back to using blue again. Remember, our, our goal is always going to be to use the lowest numbered color on the list. We want to reuse colors as much as we can so that we don't use a new color unless we absolutely have to. So Maine is done. Now we've got New Hampshire. Now New Hampshire is connected to Maine, so it can't be blue. It's also connected to Massachusetts, so it can't be green. So now we're forced to use the third color on our list, which is red. We haven't had to use red yet, but because New Hampshire is connected to both Maine and Massachusetts, we can't use blue and we can't use green, so we've got to use red. But now New Hampshire is colored. Next up on our list is New Jersey. New Jersey is connected to Delaware, so it can't be blue, 
but it's not connected to anything else that has a color. So we can once again use green, the second color on our list. And again, anytime we want to color in a vertex, we want to use the lowest numbered color that we are allowed to use. So new, it would be legal to make New Jersey red, but again, the, the greedy coloring algorithm says you use the lowest numbered color that you can at each step. Now we're up to New York. So New York is connected to a blue vertex, Connecticut. It's also connected to green vertices, Massachusetts and New Jersey. So it can't be blue, it can't be green, but it's not connected to anything red, so New York can be red. So we'll use our color number three on the New York vertex. Next up is Pennsylvania. Now, if you look, Pennsylvania is connected to Delaware, which is blue, so Pennsylvania can't be blue. Pennsylvania is connected to New Jersey, which is green, so Pennsylvania can't be green. And it's connected to New York, which is red, so it can't be red. So now, for the first time, we have to use color number four, which is orange. So Pennsylvania is going to be orange there. We're almost done. Rhode Island is connected to a blue and a green, so it can't be blue, can't be green, but it can be red, so we'll make Rhode Island red. And then Vermont is connected to a green and a red, but it's not connected to anything blue. So again, we can use the lowest numbered color on our list. We can use blue to color in Vermont. So just go through the list of colors and say, can I color this vertex with color number one? If not, can I color it with color number two? If not, how about color number three and so on. So at each step, you're using the lowest numbered color you can. So here's our solution on the graph on the left. And notice that I've written the number for the color as well as the actual color itself. So again, if you don't have colored pens or if you have any kind of color blindness or anything like that, you can use the number for the color rather than the actual color itself. And then we're translating that solution onto the actual map itself. So the vertex for Pennsylvania was colored in orange. So the state of Pennsylvania is colored in orange on my map and so on. Now, we didn't get the best answer here, so we used the greedy coloring algorithm. That's the solution on the left here. But there is actually a solution to this graph coloring problem that only uses three colors, and we can see that solution on the right. So again, as with many of the other algorithms that we've talked about, we got a, an answer that was pretty good, and we got it pretty quickly. I mean, we had 10 states. It's not like we used 10 colors for our 10 states, right? So we got a decent answer, but it turned out not to be the best answer. Now, there are more applications to the graph coloring problem than just actually coloring the regions on a map. Here's an example. Suppose you're in charge of assigning rooms for a small convention. There are several events occurring at the convention, and each event needs its own room. But we can use the same room for two different events as long as the two times of the events don't overlap. So for example, let's say our schedule looks like this. We've got 10 events labeled A through J, and they meet at different times. And the idea is to try to minimize the number of rooms that we actually need by allowing events that don't overlap to be in the same room. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a graph to represent this problem. Each vertex in the graph is going to represent one of the 10 events. And we're going to connect two events by an edge if their times overlap. So if two events have overlapping meeting times, then we're going to connect those with an edge. And the coloring of the vertex is going to represent the room that each event is held in. So we might have a blue room and a red room and a green room and so on. And so if we make sure that at vertices that are adjacent, again, in other words, vertices that are connected by an edge, if we make sure that those are in different colors, then that will make sure that those overlapping events are in different rooms. So if we draw a graph for this, and again, I've done a little bit of the work for you, but if I draw the graph here, this is what that graph ends up looking like. So again, let's make a list of colors. I'm going to use a similar list to what we used before. So in color number one, that's going to be blue. Color number two, that's going to be green. Color number three, that's going to be red. Color number four, that'll be orange. And again, we might end up having our list have more colors than we need, like we did last time, but that's okay. If we have colors that we didn't use, then we just ignore those at the end. So we're just going to go through this. So again, alphabetical order, they're labeled A through J, so an alphabetical order here makes sense. So we'll start. So starting with A, color number one is blue. A is the first vertex that I'm coloring, so of course I can use color number one here for vertex A. B, well that's not connected to A, so we can use color number one again. We're not violating our color rule by doing that, so we'll make that be color number one again. Event C, again, not connected to anything that's colored, so we'll make that color number one as well. So, so far so good. Event D, again, not directly connected to any other colored vertex, so that can also be color number one. So we're doing great so far. Now we get to E. 
So E is directly connected to vertex B, which is already colored blue, already colored with color number one. So we need to use color number two for vertex E. Next up is F. F is directly colored to A, which is uh, already colored with color number one. So we have to use color number two for F. So that gives us a two. Next up is G. G is connected to a couple of blue vertices, but not connected to anything green. So G can also be green. G can be color number two. Next up is H. H isn't connected to anything that has a color yet. So H can once again be color number one. H can be blue. All right, I, now I is connected to a whole bunch of things that have colors. So I can't be blue because it's connected to a bunch of blue vertices. It can't be green because it's connected to a bunch of green vertices. So then I is gonna have to be red. I is gonna have to be color number three. Finally, J. J is connected to a blue vertex, a couple of blue vertices, C and H. It's connected to a green vertex, G, and it's connected to a red vertex, I. And so J is going to have to be color number four. And so that's our coloring of our graph. So what this would tell us if we were trying to schedule our event is that we only need four rooms. Events A, B, C, D, and H can all go in the blue room, room number one. Events E, F, and G have to go into the green room, room number two. Event I has to go in room number three, and event J has to go in room number four. And again, we don't know that this is the most efficient way to schedule this event, but it gives us a way that we know guarantees that no two overlapping events would be in the same room. Here's another application. We know that the signals that are sent by radio and TV towers use different frequencies. So when you change the channel on your radio, you're changing to a different frequency. So if we have two radio towers that are close together, they have to use different frequencies, otherwise there would be interference. You'd be getting two stations at the same time. So here we have an example of a map where we've put locations of towers. And so there's a radius around each tower that represents the broadcast area. If you get too far away from the tower, your radio in your car can't pick up the signal from that tower anymore. So a graph that represents this problem would be where every vertex represents a tower, and then we think about the radius around each tower, and if two towers are too close together, we connect them by an edge. And what that means is that if we use different colors for vertices that are connected by an edge, that represents the two different frequencies that those towers would have to use. So for example, these two towers here, this tower might use the blue frequency, but then this tower would have to use the green frequency because it couldn't use the same frequency as the blue tower because it's too close. But then this tower down here, that could use the blue frequency again because it's not that close. It's, it's far enough away from the other blue tower where it can repeat that same frequency. So that's the idea. Here's another application. You might have seen this before. This is a Sudoku puzzle. And if you're not familiar with it, the idea is that we have a nine by nine grid and each square has a number in it. And we wanna make sure that we fill in the squares with numbers so that each three by three subsquare so this is what we call a subsquare. This up here is another subsquare. So each of those contains the numbers one through nine, and then each column, so this is a column of my puzzle. This is a column of my puzzle. Each column contains the numbers one through nine, and then each row of my puzzle. So this is a row here, and here's another row up here. So all of those contain the numbers one through nine in some order. So we can represent this Sudoku puzzle with a graph. So I'm not gonna draw it because the graph would be pretty complicated looking, but we would have one vertex for each of the 81 boxes. And we would have two vertices being connected by an edge if they are in the same column, the same row, or the same subsquare. So to illustrate this, the square that I've marked with an X here, the vertex corresponding to that square would be connected to all of the other shaded in squares because those are the squares that are in the same subsquare, the same row, and the same column. And so what we would want to do is color that graph with exactly nine colors, because then that would make sure that we have the different numbers for each subsquare, the column, and the row. So again, another way to think about how the coloring can work for a different kind of problem. Now, this is an example of a partial coloring, right? Because if I look back at the original puzzle, some of those boxes are already filled in with numbers. So again, this box up here, 
the vertex corresponding to that box is already colored with color number one. The vertex corresponding to this box over here is already colored with color number nine. And so the idea is that we were given some colors and we have to fill in the remaining ones. So this can happen sometimes. So this graph, for example, is partially colored and we could use a greedy coloring algorithm for the remaining vertices to finish the coloring. So if we get to our list of vertices, the order that we put the vertices in, and we get to a vertex that we've already colored in, then we just skip over that. So in this lecture, we've talked about the greedy coloring algorithm, which is our process for coloring the vertices of a graph. And we've seen that sometimes that doesn't give us an optimal solution, doesn't give us a coloring that uses the minimum possible number of colors. So in the next lecture, we're gonna talk about how we can try to get a handle on how many colors we might need to color a graph. And specifically what we're gonna find are bounds on that number. A lower bound, which would be the minimum number of colors that we need, and an upper bound, which would be the maximum possible number of colors that we need. And these bounds can give us an idea of what to expect about how well we did when we used our algorithm and how we can gauge what the best possible answer might be.